Good morning. If you've been able to join us on this journey through Acts, you'll know that we've been looking at portraits of the first followers, ordinary people, who were swept up in this reality of the resurrection of Jesus and how these ordinary lives were dramatically changed by that encounter. And a couple weeks ago, I encouraged you to just sit down and read Acts if you could find the time, and I, I hope that you were able to do that. And you'll, you'll know now, if you did, that it's a wonderful read. I love teaching on Acts because it's so full of amazing drama and excitement. And uh, as I say, you just really couldn't make this story up. Now, two weeks ago, we looked at Barnabas, the son of encouragement, He was a cosmopolitan Jew from Cyprus who became a central figure in the movement, peacemaker, diplomat, a mentor to the young and especially to the imprudent young Paul. And because of that, he made it possible by his patience and his intentionality for the church's greatest thinker and theologian to emerge in the figure of Paul. Last week, we looked at a different figure, the man born lame, who spent 40 years on the steps of the beautiful gate, begging for alms on his carpet. And Yahweh, we suggested, was sitting patiently at his side for his entire life. And then, only at the very end, he had this wonderful healing in an advanced age. And we realized that Yahweh, God, is with all of us in sickness and in health throughout the whole of our lives. Today our story takes us to that same scene as it continues to unfold, and I'm going to talk about several aspects of today's story, and especially the high priest to whom all these people are summoned, and they move on, um, and then uh, we're going to move on and try to pull some meaning out of the story for our lives today, as we always do. So let me just talk about a few things that are really, uh, I find, fascinating about Luke's treatment of, of this piece of history in Acts. If you were able to open your Bible and look at Acts 3.1 and look over to Acts 4.4, 4, those verses right there, you would see that it's just one brief episode in the life of the church. And there are three temporal phrases that create a real sense of immediacy and dramatic tension in this episode. So on three, chapter three, verse one, it says, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple to pray. And 311, while this man who was healed clung to Peter and John, while he clung to them, all the people ran together, utterly astonished at what had happened. And then in 41, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, And the Sadducees, they came to hold their mini trial that day. So really, in just an hour, or maybe two hours of time, from Acts 3.1 to 4.4, we go from the moment that Peter and John step onto the stairs at the beautiful gate, the healing of the man born lame, Peter's speech to the crowd, And finally, the authorities arrive to take Peter and John into custody, just this brief hour or two in time. It's quite dramatic. Basically, what this quick temporal structure means is that if it were a TV show, for example, all of this happens between two commercials. It's one very brief, very potent episode. And this is the way... Luke's artistry builds. The other thing I want to mention is is the role of touching and physical proximity in the story. You often hear me talking about these kinds of things. And it's interesting how touch plays in this scene. For example, in 3 verse 7, Peter took the man by the hand to pull him up off the steps. says, took him by the right hand, he says. Then this dear old man clung to the hand of Peter, it said, as they walked into the colonnade of Solomon's portico through the beautiful gate. 
And then as the scene plays out, and Annas, the high priest, comes to interrogate Peter and John, the old man still stands by Peter's side, clinging to his hand. Touching and physical proximity really make this story come alive and remind us how human the scene is. And you know, it also reminds us how much we all miss touch in our church congregation how we miss being together physically and seeing one another and making that kind of connection. I don't know if we'll be ever be able to go back to shaking hands, for example, but I hope so because I want to shake your hand and I want to look in your eye and I want to say, how are you doing? We need that connection. It's a beautiful part of our community of faith. And then in the trial, this is the next day, Peter and John again stand before this August assembly of high priests and scribes and scholars. And it says, they saw the man who had been cured standing beside Peter and John, still, a day later. And I think maybe they couldn't quite convince the old fellow that this was real. Maybe they were trying to kind of get their hand back. <laughs> I'm not sure. And say, you know, this is real. It's okay to go home. God has really changed your life. And then I want to point this out about Luke's uh, literary artistry as well. It says that while Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came to them, much annoyed because of what they were teaching the people and proclaiming that in Jesus there is the resurrection of the dead. So he arrested them and put them in custody until the next day. And I want to kind of paint this portrait this week of these guys in authority. We had encountered them uh, earlier as in our run-up to Easter and uh, when Jesus had his fateful um, meeting with these guys before he died. Well, here they are again. All the people mentioned in this delegation in Acts, the people that come to question Peter and John were members of the party of the Sadducees. The text tells us that. Now, both the Sadducees and the group called the Essenes, you may have heard about them. They're the folks who preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls. These two great parties within Judaism disappeared after the Great Revolt in 70 CE when the temple was destroyed. They're never heard from again in history. The Pharisees became the spiritual center of Judaism in a religion that was based on law and interpretation of the law because temple Judaism was gone after the temple was destroyed. In a way, the Pharisees emerged from that great disaster as the dominating force in Judaism, and only the law remained. And so it is today. In a sense, all of Judaism grows out of that that surviving root of Pharisaism after the temple was gone. But at the time of Acts and our story, the Sadducees are the religious leaders of temple-based Judaism and all of Israel. So it's very significant that they're the ones who come to confront Peter and John. And really, it's a confrontation between their beliefs and this reality of the resurrection that these uneducated men and this lame man represent. But we also understand that these Sadducees are the corporate representatives of the mega temple complex. Remember that? These are men of high social standing. Establishment men. Men of economic power. Men who possess a settled dogmatism of belief in what they think is right. They did not believe in personal immortality or heaven or hell, or the world to come. They didn't believe in determinism or fate or that God's will was preordained, nor did they believe in the tradition of the elders. As we encounter in uh, the Gospels in Matthew 7, Jesus talks about you rabbis have your traditions, but you ignore the law of God. So they were very stern folks. And Josephus describes the Sadducees in one passage as boorish, argumentative, heartless, and despised by the common people. 
but that they enjoyed the confidence of the wealthy. And you can just see them in this scene with their arms folded, looking back at these commoners, affronted by their boldness and their claim that the resurrection of the dead was a reality. So you see the juxtaposition of power and powerlessness. Annas, the high priest, the high priest of Israel, and a lame man from birth, a nobody, standing there side by side. I think it's kind of amusing. Luke tells us in 4, 2, that these characters were much annoyed <laughs> by these uneducated men. Greatly annoyed, the word means. Because these common men were teaching the people that resurrection was real and that Jesus was the example. Now, their objection wasn't so much about the resurrection of Jesus because they didn't believe that was possible. They were annoyed because they were teaching about resurrection in general, and it wasn't what their belief system held. So in these ordinary people, and that's what we're talking about in these series, the ordinary people come around asserting that people get raised from the dead. The Sadducees don't believe it. And in this sense, they represent to us very modern figures because that's what we face in our culture today. People just don't believe it. People believed in the resurrection. They would be transformed by it. But not these gentlemen. The first thing we should probably ask ourselves, are we not like this too sometimes? We believe something, and it doesn't matter if the evidence to the contrary is right in front of us. We won't be moved because our minds are closed. And I think the first thing we take from this passage today is that this argues for an openness of mind and heart as a fundamental trait of the Christian character. And when we stop learning, when we stop thinking, we stop growing. And the old man stands there in the very presence of the high priest, his face beaming and defiant, experiencing a joy of life that he had spent all his years dreaming about, but never thought he would experience. It must have seemed like a vision. No wonder he couldn't let go of Peter's hand. And this is where Peter says, if you come to me today questioning about this good deed that has been done to someone who was sick, and you're asking me how this man was healed, let it be known to everybody, to all the people of Israel, that this man is standing before you in good health, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead. That's the gospel standing on one foot. And as the high priest, he looks at Peter and John. Then he looks at that dear old man standing by Peter's side, clinging to his hand, and then he looks back at Peter and John. They had nothing to say in opposition. But I'm sure that Annas was thinking we were just wanting all this to go away. And here we are again. And now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated, ordinary men, they were amazed and recognized them as companions of Jesus. When they saw the man who had been cured standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. In fact, nowhere in the whole story of Acts are the Christians ever convicted of any crime by either Jewish or Gentile law, and there's lots of legal activity in the book of Acts because the resurrection of the dead is not illegal. So they said, these authorities said, well, don't talk about this anymore, <laughs> and sent them away. It was really pretty lame, actually. And they went back to their friends and uh, 
fourth chapter of Acts tells that they had what amounted to a second Pentecost. You should read it if you hadn't noticed that. So, so what, Pastor Dave? What does all this mean to us today? And I have two points, really. The first I've already alluded to, be careful of the sin of the Sadducees. Let us not close our minds down in dogmatic thinking about anything. It's not healthy. It's not right. And to do so is the path of a self-reinforcing darkness. So instead of declaring, well, I don't believe in that, we should ask, well, what shall I believe? And you see how life and faith opens up before us when we open ourselves to what God is doing. And uh, let me give you an example of self-reinforcing darkness. And uh, my partner, Christine, disassociates herself from this story entirely because it's a rather sorry story. But this is my Costco story. Now, I would expect you would hardly believe that I'd never been shopping at Costco, but it's true. We've, I, I've never shopped at Costco. I mean, I think went in once or twice with a friend who had a card, but amazing store. But I've never been a Costco shopper. And I needed to get some propane for my for my tanks because I was going camping. So I text a friend and said, where do I get propane? He said, Costco. Load up my tanks, go to Costco. Out in the parking lot is the propane filling station. So I get in the queue and I get my tanks filled. And uh, the nice lady gives me a ticket and says, go in the warehouse and pay this. So I said, well, where do I do that? She points over at the door. And said, so it's, it's the main store. So I go in my little ticket in the door, and I lay it on the counter. I say, I want to pay for my propane. And the nice gentleman says to me, well, I need your Costco card. I say, well, I don't have a Costco card. And he, he kind of looks like, it's too late in my shift for this, you know, <laughs> today. And he says, well, you have to have a Costco card. And I say, well, I don't have a Costco card as though by repeating that fact would alter the reality that in order to shop at Costco, you have to have a Costco card. And uh, so he said, well, you're going to have to get a Costco card. And I said, how much is a Costco card? It was $60. So at $19 of propane, $60 for the Costco card, $79 to fill up my two little tanks. <laughs> now I have a Costco card. It didn't matter that I didn't believe it. I still had to have a Costco card. <laughs> now, the power of the resurrection is true whether you and I believe it or not. And in Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis said it so beautifully. I just love C.S. Lewis because he's so, he's so sane. He's so clear of thought and mind. And he was writing these these um, episodes for British radio, it was uh, during the war, and uh, he'd been asked to do this. And, and he said, I'm not writing to expound something I could call my religion. I'm not telling you what my religion is, but to expound mere Christianity, by which he meant basic Christianity. And he said, which is what it is, and what it was long before I was born, and whether I like it or not. The power of the resurrection is true whether you and I believe it or not. In her introduction to that great little book, uh, Kathleen Norris says this, the Christianity Lewis espouses is humane, but not easy. It's fought on a spectacular battleground but within the ordinary human heart, where every morning we awake, we feel the pressures of the day crowding in on us, and we must decide what sort of immortals we wish to be. And that describes the ordinary folks of the Book of Acts, a spectacular battleground, but within the ordinary human heart. 
My second point is this. Peter healed that man, or he extended his hand, and God healed that man on the steps that day, yes. But then what did Peter do? Well, he was a witness. He stood there as a witness to what had happened. Bold, simple, matter of fact, no emotional manipulation, no dramatic appeal. He just witnessed to the resurrection power of Jesus. And it was the resurrection power of Jesus that was on trial in this episode. The man was healed. The disciples were, yes, uneducated men, but full of confidence and power. There was nothing the authorities could say. The disciples were simply witnesses. Modern Christian lingo, which is usually confuses things rather than clarifies things, we, we, we use witnessing in a verb form. We say, well, we're going to go witnessing, or you should be witnessing, as though it were something you do. But that isn't what the New Testament teaches at all. The word witness, yes, occurs 13 times in Acts. I looked at them all. And it's always a noun. It's not a verb. Witnessing isn't something you do. A witness is something you are. And you are a witness by virtue of the fact that you've seen something extraordinary. And let me remove a terrible burden from you that you are supposed to convince people to be Christians. I'm not good enough to do that. I'm not going to do it in a sermon. Usually that just leads to an argument. But if you have experienced something extraordinary in your life, just be a witness to it. Yes, Sometimes by words, when the occasion arises, you'll know what to say. But primarily by what you are. So let the grace of God be obvious in you by your gentleness, by your love, by your kindness to others. You are the person from whom that joy of the Holy Spirit quietly exudes. It's the same Holy Spirit that was on the steps of the beautiful gate that gave Peter, this uneducated man, the words to say as he talked to the highest authorities in the land. Let the Holy Spirit quietly exude from you. And that's really what we need to know. We are all witnesses of the power of the resurrection of Jesus. Are you a witness to God's grace? Would you like to be if you're not? You join us on this journey through Acts and this encounter with the resurrected Christ and then just walk with God. As Peter said to that man, you know, I don't have any silver and gold, but what I have, I give it to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. Thanks be to God and amen. Moon and stars, they wept. Morning sun was dead. Savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon him
sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. Lamb has overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. Lamb has overcome. Oh, we sing. I was listening to Pastor Dave's sermon today, I got a picture in my head of, uh, of something that happened fairly recently. It's always fascinating for me to watch my kids, and every afternoon I will walk down the very short road from my house down to their school. Now, what's really interesting is I can always tell a little bit about their day by how they approach me. Before they say anything, before they do anything, I know if they've had a good day or a bad day. I know if something special has happened or if it's been fairly plain. It's amazing how just a couple key things that I can watch with my kids can tell me uh, so much about their day. Now, if something exciting happened, they'll bound up to me quickly because there is something great that's happening in their lives. And you can see it changes their demeanor and they are smiling and they are ready. And yes, they do come up and they eventually tell me. But there's something different about my kids when they've experienced something great. And as we talked a little bit about what it means to be a witness today. I was struck by that thought of many of us do tend to think about witnessing as this verbal attempt to convince people. And it's scary. And that's terrifying at times. But how are we being witnesses without our mouths? without our tongues? Can the world look at you and me and see that we have encountered something special? Can they see the way I could see in my children that they, we have encountered something that's worth talking about, that's worth seeing because it has changed us inside out? Now, we do want to talk, but think back to the people in your life that were the witnesses for you, the ones that showed you Jesus first. My guess is you're probably not going to remember a sermon or a talk, but you'll remember a person. 
and you'll remember the life that they lived. So today as we leave, let's remember this wonderful thing that we are witnesses to in this great line of witnesses that we follow. Are you being a witness? Are you a witness? Would you pray with me today? Father, we thank you for this great, great tradition of people that have passed on this witness to us. Not by fancy words or convincing arguments, but by the life that they have lived. And Father, we know and we have experienced you because others have before us. So Father, allow us to be those witnesses to this world. Allow us to shine. Allow this world to see the reality that Jesus in this resurrection is something so real that even so many years later, it affects us to our very core. Father, this world needs that. Give us the strength to be that in this week. And as we prepare to continue on this week, I ask that you would be with us and walk with us. Provide us those opportunities and allow us to be that light of hope, that witness of what a life with you can look like. Amen. And may God go with you this week. May he bless you and, he, and keep you. And may he give you the strength to be the witness that he has called you to be. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're looking forward to seeing you next week. God bless you today. Art of Saying No by Jordan Letcher. Yeah. It gets old. It. No. You should practice it once in a while, Adam. It gets old. <laughs> wow, I blanked on what I was going to do next. Pause that. All right. Let me think about this. So we are... Got... 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 Got...